introduce myself. My name is Daniel Holbert. I um, actually live up in Roy, and I am um, building instruments. I started in, 2000, in 2009, so not that long, but I kind of caught the bug, and I've built quite a few things since then. Um, I, I don't do this full-time. Um, I'm an electrical engineer by training and by profession, but this one that I just really have found that it's fun to really get down and be able to create something with just some wood and some other resources. Okay, so I talked about 2009, I got my start. My very first instrument I built was this guy right here. Um, I'll point out a couple things about it. See it's pretty rudimentary, has two strings, no frets, dulcimer, yeah, yeah kind of has some elements of a dulcimer. And um, this is what I call the Altoids banjo. There's, people make guitars out of little, they call them Altoids guitars. They're two, they're two strings. And with this one I thought, because it had the round one, they we call it the, the banjo. So this one, actually, do you know, can you reach into my case in the little pocket and get, bring out my slide? I forgot to grab that. So this, even though it's pretty basic, you can get some kind of cool stuff out of it. <laughs> Easy now. <laughs> Second. Uh, I'll take the last one. Okay, so I learned, actually learned some good slide techniques this morning, but um, so you can get some interesting stuff out of it. sounds out of it. It's, you know, it's only suitable for certain styles of music, but it's still kind of an interesting, interesting little thing. So, what, what's some unique things about this? Two strings, obviously, it's fretless, but most of us, you know, there's not too many fretless ukuleles out there, so most of us like to use frets because instead of having to approximate where the note should be, the frets give us a really great, great guide. Okay. So we all have our ukuleles, and what do you think would happen to your notes if the ukulele, if the frets were a little bit off? It would sound wrong. Sound wrong. Why is that? Because, um, like, some certain chords, like, if you play them wrong, they sound bad. Mm -hmm. With the song that you play. So if so even if you have the strings tuned to the right thing, even if it's mm -hmm. so we're talking about a game of, of millimeters here, or even you know, maybe tens of millimeters. If you have it, if it's a little bit off, you'll be able to get by. But if it's a lot off, you'll definitely know. So we had to place those frets correctly. We had to place the bridge correctly, and this can be intimidating for first-time builders. I know it was for me. That's kind of why I went with this thing. I'm like, eh, I'll figure out the fret stuff later. So what people will do is they will, they will use an, a fret calculator. And here we got one, and I think I even have a laser pointer. Okay. <laughs> so a cool place um, has really great stuff. Um, is this a website called Stuart McDonald? They sell all sorts of stuff. Not so much stuff for the ukulele. A lot of a lot of guitar centric stuff. But they're kind of coming around. They're getting more and more ukulele stuff. So. One of the things we have going for us is the metric system. So we know that um, inches are nice, and it's nice to say, you know, I'm 5 foot 10, but millimeters are a lot, more, a lot easier to divide and stuff like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and plug in millimeters for our, our normal 13 inch soprano scale. Um, and, you know, that's pretty, pretty standard. And so it gets, lets us choose some variables, let us choose the number of frets, the scale length, which in this case we have 133.2. Then we have it, the units are millimeters, ukulele. So here we go, here is exactly where we should place the frets. Now the problem is, I got a 24 inch ruler here, and it's pretty hard to find 
36.025 on a ruler. You just don't have that much resolution. You have this one just has just mm -hmm. millimeters. So you're going to have to either approximate, you're going to have to place it some, somewhere close enough. But what I found, that's what I, that's what I did for my, first, for my first few ones. I just did that and I'm like, okay, Frank goes right there, right there, right there, right there, and then I would slot them in. But then I found a better, something that works out a lot better. Um, this website that I contribute to, Electric Ukulele Land, they, um, they took this open source, um, so op op an open source fret calculator, and then they adapted this to be a little more ukulele friendly. And so let's go ahead and plug in the same variables. Same millimeters, scale length, stream width, at the nut, stream width at the bridge. So, um, and for those who aren't familiar, scale length is the, the length from the nut up to the saddle on the bridge. And for this case, um, we are going to keep the same width at the bridge and at the nut. And I'll talk about that a little bit, um, why we're doing that a little bit later. And um, this allows us to put in the fret um, overhang. So that is the distance between string and the side of the fretboard. So number of frets, number of strings. And then we're able to save it to a disk, save it as a PDF. And then this is what we get out. A beautiful little thing that has, I can print this out, normal size, and then I'm able to lay that on a fretboard, and I'm able to just slot along the lines, and then I have as close to perfect as I can get with the miter box and a fret saw. So I'll show you, I'll just run through a couple pictures of how I do that. So this is, I've, I've taken that thing, I've printed it out, and then I have taped it onto my fretboard. And then it's a little bit hard to see, at least from my angle, but you can see that I put it into a miter box. And the purpose of the miter box is to keep it as square as possible. And then I've used a thin bladed saw to carefully cut along those lines. Like I said, as close to those lines as I can get, so they'll be, um, the notes will be as accurate as possible. And I'll just actually, if I pass things around, let's try to kind of snake them through and then end up kind of over here as much as possible. So be careful, we don't want anybody to, you know, and lay a fret to their finger or something. But, um, you can see that it's a very narrow blade, much narrower than most saws, and, you know, like your normal carpenter saw. And if you can see that, you can see that I've taken this board and with that kind of fret saw, I've been able to put in the frets across there and it's ready for to put frets into it. Okay. Can anybody tell me what this is a picture of? Um, it's just a picture of the Okay. I don't know if I can see that, but <laughs> close. It's a good try. Good try. Okay. What it actually is, is it is a side view of some fret wire. I brought up some lengths of this. So we'll see, uh, we'll talk about the different parts. If I did this place my laser pointer? No. I'll use this. Okay. Okay. So we're looking at the side view. This part down here is called, called the tang. Then we have the width, and then we have the height of the, the fret wire. And they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Usually the tang is pretty consistent. The width and the height will determine, like a, a ukulele will have usually different than a, like a bass guitar. Different size of string, different size fret wire. So it comes in all, in all different flavors. I usually, for my builds, I just get um, this kind of all-purpose medium style stuff. Um, and it usually works pretty well. So I'll pass this around and you can kind of see that with our little slot that we made with our saw, we would we, be easily pound it in and um, have, have frets. Okay. Uh, you, um, does it actually come in like uh, actual measurements or is it just like sizes, like medium ranges or? Yeah. Um, it'll, like, are you talking about the length? Uh, no, the actual width. 
Yeah, they'll come in. There's there's uh, medium, there's jumbo, there's narrow, okay. there's even different sizes. There's even some that are kind of more pyramid shaped. Okay. There's some that are flatter. It just it just depends on what you're doing. Gotcha. And with um, like like a, a big a big time company like you know, like Fender or Gibson, they'll be using all different sizes depending on ukes or banjos or basses and stuff like that. Okay. So they don't have specific measurements. They're more like large. Um, yeah, they um, jumbo narrow. That there's not like a uh, a two two and a half millimeter. There's nothing. I don't think there's any standard gauge. It's more along the lines of um, yeah, just it's, it's, it's what it is. Yeah. Do you have to glue it in, or if you just tap it in, it holds it? So um, there are builders that do it. They have a little bit of super glue in there, but for the most part, if you have the right saw, then you can. Um, just pound it in there with the uh, gets there, okay. With just the, with just the hammer. One thing you'll notice about this one is this is just a standard little mallet with a a rubber tip on one side, which I don't I don't, I don't have any need for for our building. Then I also have this hard plastic, and the reason we do that instead of just your 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 normal standard metal you know, carpenter hammer is that you could damage the frets with the pounding. Whereas this one, or like I said, a brass head is going to not mar the frets as much as when you're pounding it in. Um, that's, that fret saw that we passed around, that's, um, those, they come in, in a really expensive flavor. Um, and then they also come in, that one I think I get for like nine, eight, nine bucks at Harbor Freight. So it's, so it's made in Japan. I don't mean, <laughs> could, be, could, could not be, but, um, uh, I've built dozens of instruments just using that kind of saw, and it works pretty well. Um, like I said, you have to have the the miter the miter box keeps everything nice and nice and square. So if you don't have that, then your frets will look like they're if they're not parallel. It'll, it'll look bad, and you also get some sound. Can you borrow better. that from somebody, or, or can you just buy the miter box? Yeah, like how much did it cost? Uh, you know, I think I got the one I've used for a couple of years now. I got with a carpenter saw for like maybe like nine dollars. Oh, okay. Yeah, they have, they come in different they come in different sizes and Do stuff they like all that. Come in plastic? Is it yours plastic? Mine comes in plastic, and I've noticed it's it's kind of getting worn out. Um, but there's there's metal ones. Um, if you really want to go like uh, uh, someone that's doing this all the time, will get a specialty instrument miter box. Um, but for that setup and and the and the saw, you're probably looking to spend about 200 bucks. And for hobbyists, that might be a little bit out of price, especially if you're just like, uh, this seems interesting. I'll try something out, but I'm not sure if I want to just go whole hog and get everything yet. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm slowly I'm slowly getting pretty much done everything. <laughs> but I still use the cheap spread saw, so I don't know if that's what that But okay, one thing I want to point out. Oh, wait a minute. Miter box. Talk about this fret cutter. Talk about that. Talk about talk about fret cutter. Talk about grasping the files. So I, I I got a little bit. I think this is either babinga or like uh, rosewood. It's just scrap that I had, and I cut the slots just really quick, and I inlaid a couple frets into it just to test it out. The top one I cut with just these standard. Probably should know what this is called, just like wire cutters. You know, like an electrician would use. Just snap off things, wire net it together, and you're good to go. But this bottom one I did with these specialty um, fret cutters, I guess what I call them. And you can see that we're a lot closer to where, to the fretboard, to this eventual fretboard. And what that helps us out is you'll notice um, in your own ukulele that along the fretboard that the frets will be nice and rounded over. And that's what we want because we want to when we're playing, we don't want our our finger to get cut up along this, these jagged frets. So what this this specialty one does is it allow, allows us to cut very close to the fretboard, and then we're able just to take a rasp or a fine file and just slowly round it off the edge until it's comfortable to where we're, we can slide up and down the neck without getting a bloody hand. Your frets are sticking out. So sometimes that what so what will probably happen is when it left the factory, it probably the frets were probably good and then probably the humidity of like 
or the lack of humidity, I should say, in Utah shrunk the fretboard enough that now your frets are kind of sticking out. So I'm going to go ahead and pass these two around. So you can see that this is really nice because you can get really close to the fretboard. And you can see that that could do some damage to the old hand. Okay. So, I don't know, for some reason I got an Altoids kit because I found a bunch of examples online. But, I decided to try my hand at, we had the Altoids band and now we have the Altoids ukulele. So you can see that it has regular four strings, it has tiny body, it has, I think I put either 12 or 15 frets on this thing. But, ooh. Not very loud, and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna necessarily do a demo of this thing right now. But you can kind of mess around with that when I when I send it around. But some interesting things about this is it has frets, obviously, it has a zero nut. We'll we'll explore that in just a second. The concept of a zero, a zero nut or a zero fret. It has a a bridge that is in fact glued <coughs> down, but that was easy to. Um, to position into the right place to get that intonation right. Because you know, if you play the ukulele long, you'll know that um, the 12th fret should be one octave higher than the the open the open string. So um, another thing we'll explore is this non-paper neck really fast. So a normal ukulele is going to have a neck that starts out at a certain width, and it's going to slowly get bigger. And that makes it a little bit easier to play up and down. That's just kind of how, how guitars, ukuleles, and stuff are made. The advantage of a non-tapered neck for someone that's just getting into building is the fact that I can just go down to the store and buy this wood, you know, a Lowe's or Home Depot or some kind of home improvement store, and I can buy this wood. It's an inch and a half thick, and I don't have to do any extra sawing. Because if you're just getting into it, you might not have the band saws and the scroll saws and all that stuff. You can just go non-tapered neck and you can get stuff going without a lot of extra extra tools. So I'll go ahead and pass this around. Like I said, I, I brought so many instruments that if I would have tuned them all, I would have stayed up even later than I did last night. So <laughs> I'm glad I decided to sleep at least a couple hours. Okay. So here we have this Actually, look, I think I, I think I might have mislabeled the slides a little bit. Instead of a zero a zero nut, it's usually called a zero fret nut. If we're getting into semantics, but who knows who knows what a capo does? Shortens it shortens the length of the bridge to the yeah. yeah. So like you, you don't see a lot of capos for ukulele playing just because it's short enough and short enough. But a lot of times you're playing the guitar, they'll say put a capo on the third fret. So what you're doing is you're making it that much shorter. And what this is kind of doing, it's kind of cool, is we don't have to worry about having a nut that we have to adjust and have to hone and have to sand down to get it right. We can just have the strings go right over this fret and that will serve as the nut. Another advantage of that is we don't have to um, we can keep the strings where we want them to be, and we don't have to have the nut keeping those the string width in place. Um, what you'll see on the Altoids ukulele as I'm passing it around is I wanted to have a traditional um, style headstock where it's up top of the neck, so I put in four little eye screws up on the headstock, and that allowed it to dip down enough so it's not going to be buzzing along that fret, but it's going to be a nice, stable, it's going to be seated stably onto that fret. And that just saves a lot of, um, a lot of time and a lot of headache for, for beginning builders, because that's sometimes one of the hardest things to, to tweak is that nut. Getting the slots the right place and getting it low enough so our action, that is the distance between the fretboard and the strings, is not incredibly high. Okay, so going back to this subject of keeping pressure on that nut. Um, so 
the ukuleles you'll see. Um, is there any, did you have one of the ukuleles out already? Okay, well, we got one. Okay, may I, may I use this for a second? Okay, so this has a traditional nut we can all see, but we need to keep um, pressure on that nut. Um, an extreme example would be what if our headstock instead of tilted this way, it was tilted that way? Then we'd have zero pressure on that on that fret, on that nut, I should say. And if for some reason we wanted to make this more like a lute, and we had it all the way down like this way, it would look kind of funny. We'd have a lot of pressure on on that nut. Um, so for us, there's different ways to do this. One of them would be like those ice screws. Um, another thing to do would be a slotted headstock. So that's when we think of a slotted headstock, it's more of a kind of a classical guitar style, where it's um, the strings, there's two grooves in here, and the strings are angling down towards that. And that gives us a good amount of pressure on the nut. Thanks a lot. And then there's, um, we also have a string retainer. And a string retainer is if, um, picture this is up by the headstock, and we would put this in and screw it down, and then that would apply, the strings would go under it, that would apply downward pressure to keep the, the strings on that, on that nut. So that's important, because uh, if you don't have that, then it's going to really sound buzzy, it's going to sound and these are the ice screws, right? Yeah, they're the, they're the ones with the circles and then the screws on them, and then that keeps them. Is, is there like a, like a maximum distance that uh, before you'll actually start catching that ringing? Or, um, you know, kind probably of, not far, but... Yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to get, get it that much. Mm -hmm. And then you can think about it, if you have them close to that area, then you'd have, you could... Um, the farther away it's going to be, you'd have to have it lower and lower because just have that pressure needs to be closer and it just, so it just dips down just enough. Gotcha. Um, okay, so this is, I was on a trip to California a little bit ago and I went to cigar box. I don't smoke, but I wanted to find some little cigar boxes. And the cool thing about, there's this whole movement around cigar box instruments. And the reason that's really nice is because this one's actually more of a cardboard. But a lot of times you have these cigar boxes that are made out of nice wood. Um, and you think about it, a normal ukulele is going to have, you know, mahogany or rosewood or something like that. But it, essentially, if you condense it down, it's a wooden box with a neck on it and some strings. So you can take this a type, of, a type of cigar box, put a neck on it, and you're halfway there to a, a homemade instrument. So I wanted to try something which I made. So you know, like I said, you have you have stuff made out of rosewood and mahogany. You could also have one made out of, literally out of a cardboard box. And um, the cool thing about this is that um, this is a this is a pretty stable box. Um, but I, I you can see that I put a little bit of like polyurethane on or something. And then I to keep it from collapsing under the weight, this piece of wood actually goes all the way through. And then, so this piece of wood keeps the whole thing stable. Because if you think about it, if it was just a cardboard box and I had a normal traditional bridge down here, before long I would rip it off and I'd be done for. Um, so this one you can also see that the headstock is kind of um, fairly similar to the Altoids ukulele, where it um, dips down with these eye screws and then it also goes into the slotted headstock. And this one, in this case, I already have the downward angle, but I mostly use these, these eye screws to keep the strings in place. Because you could think that if these were falling off the edge of the fretboard, or they're all bunched together in the middle, it, just, it wouldn't be a playable instrument at that point. Um, this is using the same stock, I think, um, oak neck, oak, oak fretboard. Yeah. Um, if you just had like a long thin piece of wood about that big, was that like if you made it, could you just make that thing into a ukulele without having to put anything else on it except for all the stuff that you needed? Like as in like no box? Um, 
definitely could. I guess you were talking a little bit about the, man, the, the bamboo one that I made earlier. That's essentially what that is. It's a, it's a ukulele, it's just a stick that happens to have a pickup in it so you can actually amplify it versus, because um, you, you can do that and you would get a little bit of sound out of it and it would be suitable for practicing but you just wouldn't have any volume to it. So even though it's just a cardboard box and it, I mean, it's not going to sound as good as like, you know, a, a all you know, all exotic wood ukulele. It's still a pretty interesting thing. I also like to touch, this is like from a, a drain, um, like a drain stop, so I put that in there as a little sound hole decoration. And also, just to point out, we also have the floating bridge. So the nice thing about this is, if I have my fretboard right, which, um, hopefully I do, then I can move this bridge to get to the point where I know it's exactly in the right place. So that gives a little bit of, of leeway. Kind of similar to like a banjo, how a banjo works. It is just floating and you're able to adjust it. Okay, so intonation right, no, okay, I'll move this way. Oh, back, back, back until you get to the right, exact right place. So I will pass this around as well. It's called a floating. Floating, I guess the terminology is floating versus fixed. Fixed is it's going to stay in the same place, and floating is able to kind of, kind of, kind of move around, float like a, I don't know, like butterfly. a bubble, but float like a butterfly, sting like a uh, <laughs> ukulele. Um, so you don't float it down, in other words, but no. that's one that was fixed, right? You would glue down then, or you would. Yeah, we're just like going back to just like all of all, all of the all of the ukuleles and the ones in the back, the ones we have in our hands. They are all glued in. So if for, for some reason the factory made a mistake, or the shop made a mistake when they placed it, the whole thing, it would sound okay when you were playing all the strings open, not fretted, but when you finally uh, started fretting stuff, everything, everything would be off because that scale length would be all messed up. You used a metal pin for the Altoids one, and that one was glued in, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that one ended up gluing in because I wanted to, once I found out where it was, I'm like, super glue it in. And actually, I think for that one, I'm not mistaken, I just took a regular construction nail, cut off the head, cut off the, the tip, and then it was pretty, um, pretty straightforward to do. One thing kind of, in, oh, I forgot to mention, this, the plans for this Altoids ukulele, um, and another one I'm going to talk about, are actually available on, via my blog. It's circuitsandstrings.wordpress.com. And actually, I think my wife was nice enough to make a bunch of little ukulele cutouts with the, the address on that, so you can just look at that. But yeah, with that, you can, uh, with, not, with not, too many, not too many resources and not too many tools, you can make something like this. Like I said, it's not, you wouldn't probably play Carnegie Hall with it, but it would be fun just to try your hand at that build. Okay, so a while back I was hankering to build, but I didn't have I didn't have any any the right wood and have anything like that. So I decided to try to design a ukulele that was as much as possible made from parts from like a Home Depot or a Lowe's or something like that. And so what I have here is you'll notice a couple things. You'll notice that we have our bridge is just an old cabinet handle. Um, the, um, the wood is just wood you can find at a Lowe's or a Home Depot. Um, the neck is made out of uh, two pieces of quarter round and then some more, some more wood. And um, this one, I actually, I also have a plans available for this on my, on my blog. And this one was pretty cool. It's um, just a, a way to make something without a whole lot of expensive woods and, and parts. Because you'll see that most expensive ukuleles are made out of koa wood. They're made out of rosewood. They're made out of spruce. Or I know my mode has a lot of like uh, myrtle woods kind of coming to its own. And, but this is all oak, pretty inexpensive, and um, kind of a fun thing. It's obviously not too loud, it doesn't have a resonator, but I did install a little pickup on it, and um, it's kind of nice because you can just throw it in your luggage and just take it with you, and you kind of just practice, you know, 
forming the cord and stuff like that. And I was surprised the first time I got this through air, airline security because it's essentially a club. <laughs> but um, I let it through. Actually, I think I, I think people have asked about what it was a couple times, but I never got a grief for it. So. Um, you put it in your carry-on or your check? I'll carry-on. <laughs> I don't usually check luggage if I can help it. So. It's all. Do you play it on the airplane? No. Too subconscious to oh, do maybe that. You had it. I had it with me, mostly for like if I'm like on a like a, a business trip or something, like for the hotel rooms. That's a kind of party animal. <laughs> <laughs> Played a homemade ukulele in the hotel room. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so like I said, um, this one and the and the Altoids are both available. The plans are available online, and I even included. I made the fret guide, so you can just print it off, tape it on, <laughs> hammer, 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 snip, snip, file, file, and, that, and then you have that. One of the, the most difficult, perceived difficult parts already done. If you already had the tools, what would the cost be for the travel one right there? Oh, this one? Yeah. Okay, so um, okay, so oh, we have the tools. Tuners, if you go to the right place, we'll talk about where to get some of these parts. Um, you can probably get four, a set of four tuners for six, seven dollars. The fret wire, you usually have to buy it in a little bit bigger packages, um, but it's like a dollar fifty worth of fret wire. Um, cabinet handle, a couple bucks. Um, I think I estimated because of different stores and stuff like that. On my website, I do essentially different tiers. I have the, the inexpensive, medium, and then the, the pricier ones. And I think I had this at the, the probably the, the thirty dollar range. So it's maybe a little more than that. Maybe a little cheaper than that. If you can scrounge some of these parts, then you can probably make it a little cheaper. But that's just for the parts, probably like the 25, 30, maybe up to 40, depends on where you get, get stuff. And how much was the pickup? Oh, um, oh yeah. the pickup, <coughs> we'll talk about a little bit more about pickups and the pickups that I put in and put in my different instruments. But um, you can get the pickups for, um, depending on what style, either the round or the, the rod type, for the neighborhood of um, a dollar to like a Dollars. Sure. Then you can get the, the jacks. You can either get online or get like it at um, Radio Shack has parts, and so that probably added the pickup probably added five six dollars to it. Mm -hmm. Um, say like with a normal ukulele, if it didn't have pickup, could you install it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, you definitely could. Um, let's, we can talk about that a little bit more later. But what you could do is um, the different type of pickups whether it be kind of a microphone style or really popular these little piezo ones. Um, just a little bit of modification. You'd have to, you'd have to change probably the bridge, um, the, the saddle that's in the bridge that is, and you'd have to install some kind of jack and then you could um, plug it right into an amp and you know, rock out. Yeah, I was just wondering because I wanted to install it from the wizard. Oh, get an amp? So you want to like really really rock out or something? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I actually, uh, not to plug myself, but um, <laughs> later, right after the picnic, I'm doing the advanced one, and we'll talk about, these are pretty rudimentary, but I have some ones that are pretty, a little more involved and like pretty, I think, interesting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we'll talk about the different types, and it's, it's, fairly, it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, I would recommend that maybe I'm doing it on your only ukulele, but if you had an old one you wanted to kind of experiment with, and um, you did. You felt comfortable around tools, or you knew someone that could do a few things. And it's, it's a pretty straightforward process. Parts, parts, parts. Okay. So there's different places where I've i bought parts in the past. Um, I lost my oh, blending in. Yeah. Okay, so this is this is what I wish I would have discovered sooner. This is cbgiddy.com, and what this stands for is cigar box guitar. Giddy, I guess, is backwoods for guitar. <laughs> but um, this is this is the place that I found has really good prices on on I don't want to say inexpensive, but like on stuff that we would put on the Altoids banjo. They have tuners that cost you know hundreds of dollars for a set, but for something like this, it would be kind of ludicrous to put really expensive tuners on it. So we can get ones that we could buy for seven dollars a set. 
then we could make three Altoids banners on it. Um, they also have these little electric elements we can put. They have the jacks. They have these more, um, these little more expensive style tuners, these seal tuners as they're called. I believe these go for um, like thirteen dollars a set. So it's not you know necessarily super cheap, but it is affordable way to get you know nice tuners that are going to be a little bit more stable than sometimes these open gear ones are. Um, they also have. I said tons of jet, tons of these these mono jacks. We're gonna plug in our, our amps. Um, I buy fret wire by the pound. Um, this one it says it's one pound and it was 68 feet worth of that fret wire that we were handing around earlier. And that I think left, I probably got 20 instruments out of it. You can also buy it in smaller in smaller lots. To, you know maybe enough to make three or four fretboards, but that's nice to have. Um, yeah, I buy, um, you can also buy some of our boxes there, you can buy all sorts of stuff. So that's a good place where you're like, okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go and spend, you know, 25, 30 bucks on some parts, and then I'll um, experiment. Mm -hmm. How much would, like, the Altoids Banjo or the Altoids Eco Lily cost for everything? To, to build it all? Um, like you would install a pickup into it as well? No, like okay. just a little bit. Okay. Uh, well, the nice thing about it, if you buy this tin, there happens to be a bunch of little delicious <laughs> treats in there. <laughs> you know, that's two bucks. <laughs> Strings. Um, couple of, well, it depends. If you buy, I mean, an expensive way to buy it would be like buy a guitar. Um, buy um, a guitar set for $7 and then just use a couple of the strings. I actually, nowadays I actually buy these in bulk, so I'll buy like 12 strings, like 12 E strings, 12 B strings, 12 G strings, and all the way up. Um, and then um, I'm guessing you could probably, I'm not going to include like shipping to get it to your house necessarily, but you could probably do it all for around 15 bucks, maybe. Like Ukulele, um, you know, not much more than that. I, I didn't install a pickup in that one. You'd probably be in the, in the down in dust in somewhere in the $20 range. But some of your first ones, you also took apart old ukuleles we found at like garage sales and stuff. That's true. That's another place to get parts. You like, sometimes you go to a thrift shop and there's like these old toy guitars that are just made of plywood, super cheap, no good. But yet you could scat, you could take a bridge off it, you can take tail pieces off it, you can salvage the neck. Like I, I sometimes throw away the bodies and keep the necks because they're pretty useful in tuners, the nuts. Just take, take apart everything and keep all the pieces and go to the puzzle. That's what I do. I don't, I don't ever throw anything away. It's just related. Or <laughs> pretty much anything in my life. Just does. <laughs> I'm one step away from being a hoarder. If I, I, have, I have probably 40 ukuleles and if, you know, that's a cool collection, I guess. But if my, if my collection was, you know, old newspapers, then that's not a cool collection that I could order. <laughs> a very a very fine line between affording and like being a uh, collector. <laughs> but um, going to, so going back up to here, I think I might have okay. Stuart McDonald. This is like um, this is where like the pro shop. Um, this is where like the people that do it for a living they shop there. Um, they do have some pretty cool stuff, and some stuff is some stuff is not, is pretty affordable as well. Um, like for example, if you wanted to upgrade your ukulele, for some reason you like the tuners, this is where you go. You could buy a fifty dollars set um, of tuners for your ukulele and upgrade and upgrade them to make it a little more um, you know fine tuning or whatever. And they also have I bought bridges there. I bought um, fret markers there, um, like this one. I think I added some. Had some little fret markers that I had around and just inlaid them. And they have stickers too if you want to go really easy. Ooh, you can yeah. buy it just a little. Because I, I got a guitar kind of thing and it didn't have those and I like them. And so I yeah. just bought them, they're real cheap ones. Okay, so you're like third fret, fifth fret. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's another way to do it. Really easy. Or think about it, I mean, you could even like uh, just go to like a craft store, get little dots. Even those little circle things you use to protect, like um, notebook paper, you could do that, and then you could protect it by putting like a little like polyurethane coat over it. Just make like you know, just make your own little cool thing. I've seen pennies inlaid to fretboards. I've seen some people 
just um, countersink a couple screws into it, so you have kind of a cool industrial look. It's really anything, you know. Like I, 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 I spend the more than I like to bit amount of time in like craft stores, <laughs> like beads and, and stuff. I'm like, I could inlay that into a fretboard and have like gold inlay or something like that. You could do kind of a lot of popular stuff. Um, Stuart McDonald also has some. I'll talk about this a little more in my next class, but. A kit where it's solid wood, where the sides are already bent, it's already kind of the neck's already shaped, and then you can just carefully assemble it and have a solid wood ukulele um, for a pretty good price. Um, another place I've really got, gotten to like lately is eBay. Um, they have a lot of parts, and what I they have parts from all over the world. I bought stuff from China, I bought stuff from America, I bought stuff from I think I'm buying something from like Bulgaria. I bought stuff from. I bought, I, brought, I bought some bridges from Turkey. So you can get all this stuff from all over the world. And the cool thing is, like, especially, I'm not sure how they do it, but China, you can get stuff um, like tuners. And the shipping is free somehow. <laughs> you buy a dollar fee and the shipping is free. I know. Like, I bought, yeah, I bought things for a dollar. It's like, and it takes, you know, it's going to take three or four weeks to get to your house, but then it shows up like, Wow. And the nice thing is, you ordered it so long ago, you got, you bought it. And it's like, ooh, <laughs> bonus. <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and then another one that I, I don't use it as much lately, but um, this, this um, the guy that owns this Grizzly um, tool website, there's also showrooms in the United States as well, but I guess he's really into building guitars, so he's like, I sell all these industrial tools, and by the way, I also have this little section where I sell like guitar kits and ukulele kits and, and tuners and stuff like that. And there, um, we have a cool little kit. So this is a um, pretty cool little kit. It, you can see that the neck's already shaped, and that's a big deal because that can be that takes a little bit of, of, of um, expertise to do that. The body is already already made. Has all the, and the tuners, the nut, the bridge, and all that stuff, and you then you essentially just assemble it. I mean, it's going to be, it's not going to be the best ending lady I've ever, it's ever had. The body is going to plywood. Um, this is going to be, um, I think it's some kind of mahogany, so it's it's okay. Um, the body, like that, the body is plywood. But the cool thing about this is you can get them for like, on sale, you can get them for like 25 bucks, the kit. Um, sometimes, I think the normal price is 27 $30. Or you can get that shipped to your door, um, and then you can kind of assemble it. And they have pretty good, pretty good instructions. Um, so that's kind of helpful. And you just glue it together, or how? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you glue the neck on. You glue the fret. The fretboard's kind of this. The fretboard's probably the, one of the. This, the fretboard and the strings are probably like the worst part of it. The fretboard's kind of like this plywood thingy. It looks okay, but it's just. It's not gonna be as nice as like a rosewood one, or even one made out of just like oak, custom made one. But yeah, the strings, I just put my own strings on the ones that I made. Um, I had this whole thing where I was like, I went to with my four-year-old son, we're gonna build this kit, and, and then before I knew it, I had just taken over and just sanded it myself, and <laughs> myself, and then at the end, oh, here you go, it's done. So it didn't turn out as well as I thought it was going to, but it was, now we have the ukulele, I guess, to go with the other 35 that we have. Um, but that's a pretty cool thing. Like I, um, at my first, when I first started out, I was really intimidated by, by the neck and the fretboards. So actually, I, just, I got a couple of kits just to use the necks on other projects. So I'm like, eh, that's, even if I'm just, take, I'm just using half of it, you can't buy the necks for 20 bucks, and I'll just use it and I saved the bodies and I made stuff out of those later, so it worked out pretty good. Okay, so I've probably just been prattling on for a long time, but um, now is the time for any questions that anybody might have about this. Are you selling you the same bill? Um, it's a good question. I should be. The problem is, is I get so attached to that, I can't see it apart. So now I have this room that's just literally lined with ukuleles. Yeah, it's like, um, 
I mean, I, 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 am, I am donating one of my ones that I made out of my brother's bamboo floor today <laughs> to be part of the uh, open mic competition. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, um, there's, I think I'm also I'm donating one of my friends is having this charity auction. I donate one to him, and I've, I've, I have shipped um, some of these all over the world. But I, I don't, I don't sell that many because I, like I said, get too attached to those. Uh, and his wife on the same time. But um, and then also another thing is by because it's just a hobby, I have the freedom just to make one offs all day long. I don't have to I don't because I honestly get bored if I had to make a hundred of those Altoids you blaze because it's just straightforward and it's kind of here and all that. But I like being able to explore oh, I want to do this time, I want to do this thing, I want to do that, I want to make this and that and all that kind of stuff. So maybe, maybe sometime. Um, yes. Uh, with the floating, with the floating bridge, do you? Uh, how do you monitor? Like, do, do you have problems with the a action, like actually raising up, uh, depending on where it's actually sitting in the uh, in the body? Um, yeah. So that would be a problem. You think that um, an extreme example is if we move that one on the, on the, on the, the cardboard box one all the way up probably have to actually be too high. So yeah, you have to, um, when you're placing it, you might have to do a little sandpaper and, um, to get to the right place. Um, because if not, then you're like, oh, well, this is too high or too low, and both are. You know, we all know that there's that, kind of that sweet spot where it's, it plays nice, but it's not going to buzz, and it's just going to be just a nice, <coughs> nice playable instrument. So are you saying you sand it down so it's a little lower if it's too high? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like, like for the alto ukulele, I found um, I was trying a different things. I think I tried a, like a, a like a screw or something. That was a little too big. But finally, like, ooh, that nail works pretty well to get it to the action. And like, you know, uh, someone someone that's doing this and selling the ukulele, they'll they'll kind of have their own different styles to get that nut and that saddle right to the right place where it's, it's the, the right height for the action. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, with that, uh, like I said, after lunch, I believe it's at, what time is it? At uh, 2.15. I'll be doing one where I'm going to, if you like these ones, I got some I got some really cool ones later. They look a little bit a little sleeker than these ones. And um, go to my, if you want to know, no information, more information on what I'm doing, go to my, what, my blog, my YouTube channel, um, my, my, my username is Circuits and Strings. Um, it's cool. And I have quite a few, it's a bit quite, cool, quite a few cool stuff. With that, um, no more questions. Have a great day, have a fun picnic, and have a great, have a great festival.